seeing the microphone dots. Can everybody hear me okay? Let's make sure that we have sound before we proceed. I apologize for the technical difficulties earlier. Yep, okay. Awesome. Looks like we have sound, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody still having trouble before I begin? Okay, seeing none, uh, cross-examining uh, primarily the, but uh, we're also going to be talking about cross-examining other witnesses as well, generally, but mostly it's gonna, the focus is on how to cross-examine a cop. So uh, as a form of introduction, some of you probably already know me. My name's Larry Foreman. I uh, branded myself as the DUI guy because that's pretty much the primary bulk of my work. All pleasantries aside, um, I think cross-examining the officer is going to be a fun topic for everyone, whether you're a lawyer or a non-lawyer, because it's a skill that uh, is not something that we're born with. Um, it's Cross-examining is an art, and it's something that you read about, you learn about, uh, you learn by uh, watching other people, and of course the best way to learn is you learn by doing. Uh, there's no better way that I've learned to cross-examine. I'm still far, far, far from perfect. I'm still a newbie, um, but I'm, I've gotten better because I have uh, practiced. Uh, I've been doing it for a few years now, so I'm not a total rookie, but I'm still, there's always room to improve. So uh, where does cross-examination come in, first and foremost? Um, the parts of the trial are very simple. In a, both in a criminal and a civil trial, first you pick your jury. Once the jury is seated, the first witness, I'm sorry, uh, you go through openings. Uh, usually the Commonwealth or the plaintiff goes first, at least in Kentucky. That's the way uh, we do things. Some states are a little different. They have uh, uh, rebuttal openings and rebuttal closings, but, but we won't. I don't know much about other states. I just know Kentucky's so because that's what I've learned. Uh, so in Kentucky, the Commonwealth or the plaintiff will do their opening. The defense will do their opening, and then we dive in to the first witness for the prosecution or the plaintiff. And then once they give their testimony, the defense has the opportunity to do something called cross-examination. And that is basically you're trying to fill in whatever gaps the, the plaintiff or the commonwealth has left out. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to put the witness uh, in the hot seat, literally, they're they're in the hot seat and they have to answer your uh, questions. So those are the parts of the trial leading up to cross examination, and uh, that is the first opportunity that the defense will have to cross examine a police officer. For instance, in my cases, uh, the majority of trials, the police officers will be uh, the first. One of the police officers will be the first witness uh, if there is no expert. Sometimes, uh, usually they will go uh, second. I mean, it really depends on how the prosecution has their trial structured, but they want to put on their star witness, essentially, the, is going to be the arresting officer. And then all supporting officers will go before their star witness, to maybe fill in whatever other details, which seems kind of weird and counterintuitive, but um, the, the, the star witness will, the, the, the tricky thing is the police officer uh, the star witness gets a chance to sit uh, next to the prosecutor throughout throughout the whole trial. So it's interesting that uh, we know from law there is this uh, law uh, requiring a sequestering of witnesses, a, a, a phenomenal law of evidence, so that not every witness is going to hear everyone else's testimony and then testify in accordance with the other testimony that they have already heard. Uh, somebody even, I think, criticized one of my videos. Uh, it, it, they don't understand that I was a suppression hearing uh, where the other officer was sitting there, and I really didn't care what the other officer was going to say. All actually needed him to hear everything that the other officer was saying anyway. It made no difference for my purposes, but whatever. People will criticize no matter what you do, so get used to it. 
Um, but uh, the sequestering of witnesses allows uh, the officer, the star witness of the Commonwealth in, in traffic, DUI cases, et cetera, uh, or even any criminal case really, to hear the testimony of every other witness uh, before they testify. So it's kind of convenient. They've already heard the whole story and talk about uh, uh, a clean system, right? They already have heard all the evidence, all the testimony of all the prior witnesses, and then they get to go last. So that's why they usually go last. That kind of helps them not contradict themselves. So first they'll ask questions like, where are you employed? How long have you been employed there? To show that this is not just a rookie cop, or sometimes it will be. I've had officers on the stand say, I've been, at the time of the arrest, I was seven months from the academy, nine months from the academy, 15 months from the academy. Uh, not uncommon at all, um, because every cop of every variety is going to have his uh, share of arrests. And once the foundation is laid, you are going to, the prosecutor, excuse me, is going to lead into the foundation for the case itself. Um, the foundation for the case uh, is going to involve facts like, let me take you back to August 1st, 2016. You remember uh, having uh, coming into encounter with Mr. Smith, so-and-so. Yes, and, and then you saw Mr. Smith in this kind of car, da 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 and uh, leading into the facts of this particular case. And then since you can't really ask leading questions with some exceptions during direct examination, that's going to be the pretty much the entire uh, prosecution's uh, direct with respect to the officer. And then comes the fun part, uh, the defense's uh, cross-examination. So what do you do? Usually, uh, I structure my cross-examination in a very particular manner. Uh, I've learned from some of the best, and uh, I just, you copy and paste them, a lot of things in this profession, and this is no exception. Uh, what you first want to do is you want to lay your own foundation. So what does that mean? First, what I like to do is if it helps me, if it doesn't, then I completely skip it. If it helps me, I will try and pin the officer as the best in his field, right? Which will seems kind of counterintuitive in a sense. Like, why would you do that? Well, if I know that he made a lot of mistakes later on and I want to pin him on that, it looks a lot better that he testifies at first that he is so uh, brilliant and magnificent and experienced rather than him being uh, a total rookie not knowing what he's uh, doing. Because then the jury's going to give him, cut him a little bit of slack, kind of forgive him on, on a lot of aspects. I don't want that to happen, especially if I know that he screwed up. So I want to present him as this expert, experienced, et cetera. Uh, I know actually of mine, won a case in uh, West Virginia just recently, I believe, where uh, the officer was classified as an expert by the prosecution, and he was trying to avoid that unsuccessfully, but then he used it to his advantage in this exact fashion. Uh, he used the officer's expertise against him, showing all the faults that he has, he has done uh, or failed to do, excuse me, in the case where he should have pursuant to his training. So what do you do next? Uh, now that you have uh, satisfied the criteria for the officer laying him as this master of his field sobriety testing field or whatever it may be, and in, in this case, in DUI cases, it will be... Um, trained pursuant to the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, went to the academy, got his 40 hours there, maybe got a follow-up course. I always like to get the transcripts for these officers if they're A-RIDE certified, the uh, Advanced Roadside Impairment and uh, Detection and Impairment uh, uh, Manual, if they've done those, and just kind of like supplemental courses. It also shows if, if an officer has done a lot of follow-up courses, it gives me an idea that this officer is really dedicated to his craft and he may be a difficult um, adversary on the stand. Uh, I've seen it both ways. I've seen officers that just don't know what they're doing and you just pin them down further and further. And you'll have the officer that is extremely well-trained who's trying to follow in his father's footsteps. For instance, I had one uh, quite a long time ago, but it was, it was brutal. It was really brutal. Uh, I will admit to it freely. Um, he was so well versed in the field sobriety testing um, 
subject that even I felt at a loss and I realized luckily it was at a suppression hearing. So uh, I was trying to pin on him that he didn't do certain things, but he, he proved me wrong. Uh, I was still in the learning stage back then. I, would, I don't think I'll repeat that mistake again, but I learned, I learned that some officers will definitely show themselves as masters of their craft and you should be prepared. You need to know your adversary. I mean, Sansa, one of my favorite uh, writers of all time who wrote the art of war, has said, uh, if you know thy enemy and you know thyself, then your chances of victory are, are all that much higher. Uh, and trial is no exception. By the way, remember this, cross-examination, trial, it is war, okay? There are no fun and games. That's all out the door. I learned this the hard way. I'm just trying to, to instill in you guys, if you're gonna be trying your pro se cases out there or uh, you young lawyers, who are trying to become better uh, adversaries for your prosecutors and whatnot. All the fun and the games is out the door when you are trying a jury trial. Okay. You can, at the end of the trial, you can go grab a beer, you know, a uh, cup of coffee with the prosecutor. That's fine. But in the courtroom during trial, there is no pleasantries to be exchanged and whatnot. I don't, some people can do it. I don't understand how they can do that because the trial is a war zone. Okay. Anyway, that's the way I see it. And I think if you see it that way, it will help your game a whole lot more than if you just try to, to be buddy, buddy and kind of friends with, with the cop, because it's a lot harder to cross examine and essentially try and destroy somebody who you're trying to be friends with on the side. So uh, again, just my take on it, maybe, Experience may vary. I don't know. So uh, where were we? Let's get back to the, the cross-examining of the officer. Um, once you set the foundation, once you have established the parameters uh, of what he's capable and not capable of, something that I really like to do is what I like to call marrying the officer to his report. In Kentucky, we are very, very lucky that um, the officers, what we have, will oftentimes write very, 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 very short, narrow reports. Now, why is that good? It's good for two reasons. Number one, it is good because they, they leave off a slew of other information. But you might think, well, this is all he needs to win, right? Well, this is where number two comes in. All this information that they left out I use in front of a jury. So what, what is marrying him to the report? This is where that comes in. I, I explain, I, as I talk with the officer, I, you ask him certain questions that um, during cross-examination to pinpoint a, a certain, how should I put this? Very hard to quarrel if he is to agree with me. He's going to have to say that uh, you're absolutely right, counselor. I left out a lot of things. And that's not something he wants to agree with me, especially on, on cross-examination in front of a jury on a case where he wants to show superiority and knowledge. So once I nail him down to th these four corners of this one report, and I, one of the cases I've posted on, on YouTube, the, um, uh, the Cuban uh, CDL DUI that I won, they had two sentences two sentences in the entire report. Now the prosecutor should never have tried that case in the first place. There's no question there, but she did anyway. Uh, she had two sheriff's deputies that had maybe 12 DUI cases in 20 years of experience. The, the jury was horrified. I had six women on that simply horrified when they heard that there are only two sentences in the entire report. I mean, each of them was sitting there thinking, what if that was me? And they did that to me. Like, how does that make you feel? It's horrific. You can't use the golden rule, but everybody knows that the golden rule uh, happens anyway, even if you don't talk about it, uh, if you do things properly. So instead of, well, after you marry him to his report, instead of fearing those good facts uh, that the prosecutor just brought out uh, to use against your client, the, the fact that he, he saw the flushed face, he uh, he smelled the smell of alcohol, that he he saw the bloodshot eyes. I mean, all of those negative, crucial points that he needs to win, you start pointing out things that the officer didn't see. So, officer, you did not see them uh, stumbling. 
especially if there's video. It's extremely useful if there's video, especially if they look sober, forget about it. Uh, when the officer starts testifying about how he rigorously followed his training and uh, saw all these clues, the jury sometimes uh, will not follow that to the T uh, because they see things their own way. And they're almost never going to see things the way that the officer does, especially if the individual looks sober on camera. It is staggering how many cases I have right now where the individual is uh, looks sober on camera. Prosecutors continuing to move forward, but it is what it is. Um, they're just doing their job. So what do you do? So now you got all this training and experience that you brought out of the officer and you have all these facts that he testified to. And like I said, you start filling in the blanks. What did you not see? You did not see them staggering. You did not see them, uh, using the the vehicle to balance themselves uh, of course you want to talk about uh, their driving as well they saw them speeding well officer are you aware that as you were trained in the academy that speeding is not one of the 24 cues that you look for when you're looking for intoxicated drivers on the road and it is it is not one of the 24 and if they they testify that it is they look like an idiot because at some point the jury will start believing you over the officer. There's one um, fun uh, statement of fact. I have a certificate. I completed the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration uh, DUI training course myself. The 40 hours, I took it with uh, uh, a police officer here in Georgia named Tony Palaccios. God bless him. Uh, he's amazing. The amazing work he does. And he's training lawyers all over the country on how to perform and understand field sobriety tests and how to help us make officers better officers on the street by having us cross-examine the shit out of them. And then when they're released back into the street, they understand that they have to do their job better and thus becoming better officers. So I think it's a win, win, win all around. And uh, I will bring that fact out in, in the middle of cross-examination officer. Are you aware that I myself has been uh, trained? There's no certificate, by the way, if any officer ever says I've been certified by NHTSA, National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, I've been certified by NHTSA as a standardized field sobriety testing expert. God forbid. Oh, I haven't had that happen yet, but I can't wait for the day that it happens. Are you aware, officer, that there's no such thing as a certificate or as an expert in those fields? Now, there is a drug recognition expert. That's a whole different field. But uh, there is no certificate. Uh, you, you do just get like a certificate, but you, you're not. You can uh, certify others on how to give the uh, field sobriety test. But uh, if you're just a student, then you're just a student. Uh, you've completed the course, congratulations. You just, you have a certificate, you're not certified. That's what I was trying to say. So I will tell to the officer, are you aware that I've completed the course and I have a certificate myself hanging in, uh, in the office, which will be in probably about a week when it comes back with the, uh, those fancy little golden frames that you see back there. And uh, sometimes I'll get an objection to that by the prosecutor, but it's too late. The jury has already heard it and the officer has already heard it. And now they know that I also have the requisite training and understanding of the, the, the field sobriety tests. And I completed the course myself, uh, the sitting back there. Okay? And I know which book he's trained under because there have been books released in uh, 06, 13, 15, I think there's one in 18. And I know which one he completed and which one, which one he learned from because I got his transcript, right? So I know when he completed the academy. Unless he's been grandfathered in, which was actually my first case I've ever tried. And I haven't had that issue since, but there are very, very few officers still remaining out there who've been grandfathered in in the 90s who have never taken the NHTSA course. And it's... So fill in the gaps. That's what you want to do. Uh, you got, you saw X, Y, and Z, uh, but you didn't see A, B, and C. And A, B, and C point towards sobriety. Now, this brings me to a very, very crucial point. Never ask the last question. Never, ever, ever ask that question that's burning in your mind that you really, really, really want to ask. Don't ask it. So after you lay your foundation with respect to whatever topic you are talking about, you did not see the uh, 
let's say you did not see the flushed face, which is consistent with intoxication, correct? And by the way, don't say correct or yes at the end of every sentence. They get it. It's a question. If you pause, they'll understand it's turn, their turn to answer. It's really annoying when a lawyer goes, and then da 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 da, da yes, and then da da da, correct, and then da da da, yes. Believe me, I do it all the time, and I'm trying to fix myself too, so don't judge. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you saw uh, that the individual had a flushed face, correct. You, you did not see that they had bloodshot eyes. I did not. You did not see them stumbling around. I did not. Uh, those are consistent with sobriety, correct? Yes, they are. Furthermore, during the conducting of the administration of the field sobriety tests, uh, you did not see them not touch heel to toe. You probably want to phrase that differently. You saw them touch heel to toe on all nine steps on the first nine. I did. And that is consistent with sobriety, correct? Yes, yes, it is. And you go on and on and on. And then finally, when you're done with all of that, the burning question is, so they were apparently sober, correct? Never ask that question, ever, because he is on the other side of the V, okay, to jail. He's not your friend. He is not your buddy. He is not there to agree with you. He's not there to help you. So you lay the entire foundation, you get to that question, and then you move on. And that way, the jury asks that question in their own minds, and they don't have a response from the officer because you never asked it. The way all of that momentum remains uh, in the field, if you will. I don't know. I think you understand where I'm going with this. That energy remains in the trial. Now, the prosecutor may try on uh, redirect. Uh, and once you sit down, they have a chance to uh, direct their witnesses again to fill in whatever gaps they want to fill in. But they can only, they can't lead the witness. Leading the witness, by the way, I apologize if, if that term is unfamiliar to some of you. That's when you're asking uh, questions that lead a certain answer. And the frame was black. And it had uh, golden uh, coloring inside of it. And the diploma was in the center of it. Those are all leading questions. Non-leading questions on direct examination would be, and what color was the diploma? And what color was the inside frame? And what color was the diploma itself behind the glass, et cetera? So on direct, if an officer, excuse me, if a prosecutor begins, some, certain things are inescapable when it comes to leading questions. Uh, you arrived at 10 p.m. Objection, leading question, that's too much. Obviously, time, certain things that are completely not within dispute, time, location, um, color, unless it's a central issue in the case, Certain things like that uh, will will never be subject to an objection for uh, as a leading question. Those are just basic uh, exploratory questions. But as soon as they start diving in a little deeper, and you obviously saw that they were intoxicated, correct? Objection, leading speculation, lead, asking for a conclusion, Your Honor. You know those sorts of things. Uh, you you obviously want to jump on, and eventually you do this long enough, you start getting kind of an instinct for those things. And as soon as you hear them, it just kind of sparks. Also, a very beautiful um, example is uh, one of my trials, I believe it was the Hardin County military um, guy that I've tried in 2015, that trial. The prosecutor has really, uh, became really, really aggressive with him. And back then, granted, I was still a younger attorney. I probably wasn't doing things as, as right as I should have, but the jury will hate the prosecutor for being really mean to your client and they will hold it against them, especially if your client is okay. And, and he was holding his own. He's, uh, he's in the military. He has done, uh, several, he told me he has done several, um, I forget what they're called. I think they're promotional hearings that he, he said that he uh, that basically does the exact same thing. He's kind of like in a witness stand. There's a panel, and he has to talk to them. So when I started explaining the jury process to him, he was like, oh, it's kind of like this. And I'm like, yeah, okay. If that's that's what it is, then by all means, use it. And I could have objected. I could have tried and saved him, even though he didn't need saving. So cross-examination is also learn to pick your battles. Um, 
And that brings me to another point. When you're cross-examining and the officer starts fighting you on a very, very simple question or uh, maybe stating something ludicrous that just doesn't make any sense at all, don't forget your jurors over there, they're people too. They, they can hear and they can see everything just like you can. So don't think you're in this isolated bubble, which I did. I remember when I first started doing this, that, uh, oh, my God, I, I really need to highlight this for them. I got to I got to I, I got to emphasize it and, and go after it. I've learned and there's a very simple uh, tactic that I've that I've used just to kind of make sure that the jury's heard. I will ask them point blank. There is not a single rule written anywhere. You can ask them, can you all see that? Is that is that all right? Or if the officer testifies to something, did, did you all understand what he what he or she said? They'll nod their heads because again, there are there are people and there is not a single rule that prohibits that sort of interaction. Now you cannot start asking them questions in the middle. And by the way, I know a fun fact, uh, jurors do have the power to ask questions in the middle of trial. They just almost never do because nobody really brings it up. And it's extremely rare to really have that. Usually questions come in deliberations or during jury selection. But in case you're wondering, those minor interactions are okay so long as they're there for clarification purposes and not for that you want those words for him to say. He's never going to say them. Even though you both know that you're right, the jury will will get the hint, usually, if you do it right. And never ask the last question. Like I said, leave it burning in the jurors' minds, and that will have a, a much, much greater effect um, for, your, uh, for your trial and for uh, a two-word verdict. And do it by topic. Uh, ask your questions and categorize them and have, I forget the, the word for it, but the, the next leading, uh, let's talk about the field sobriety. Excuse me. Um, and once you uh, have all your chapters ready, that will give you and the jury a much, much clearer understanding of where you're headed, what's the next topic, and where are you now, so that they're not bored to tears. Because cross-examination, when done improperly, the thing that I can tell you that a defense lawyer can do is to simply do a direct, reinforcing all of the questions on direct on cross. That is the absolute worst thing that you can do to your trial because you're basically rebuilding the prosecutor's case. And the jury has heard nothing new. Maybe they've heard it with greater emphasis and, and higher tonality, and higher pitch, but that's it. And they're gonna convict and you're not gonna get anything out of it. So, uh, and of course, very, very important, uh, one thing that I kind of left out, have a, a theme for your trial, that's kind of like a given, but when you're crossing the cop, have one or two or three, but at least one central point that you wanna focus on. And don't lead with it, unless you have enough to where you can lead and kind of have one in the middle and one at the, the very bottom, uh, at the very end, excuse me. You want to make sure that you keep the juror's interest. And it's gonna be very hard to do if you're up there cross-examining an officer for two and a half hours, okay? Uh, so try and keep it short, again, unless it merits not to have a short cross-examination. Like I had a case, uh, then it ended up settling but I had maybe about 90 questions before the officer even pulled her over, like came to a stop, I mean. Uh, all those were preludes as to how the stop occurred, et cetera. Those are all well and good, and they worked for me, would have worked for me had I tried that case because there was no video. And I was trying to paint a picture. This is what you're doing in cross-examination. You're painting a picture to a jury, whether you have video or not. Uh, if you have video, you're simply reinforcing that. Uh, if you don't have video, then you're painting a picture. You're a painter. You're an actor. That's that's your job as the, the trial lawyer in that case, in that situation. So uh, also, I already kind of alluded to this. This is also important. If the cop 
um, the jury will dislike him and they will like you for not being afraid to um, not being afraid to to attack him. And similarly, if the officer is very friendly and very positive and very happy, kind of pleasant, then don't bash him. Okay, you're only going to lose points. But yeah, sorry guys, I, I don't know if it's if it's the connection or or what, but I'll uh, I'll I'll try and fix it later on. I think it's in the office. I probably need to your audience. You got to gauge your speaker. Um, so that's just how I do my cross examinations. Uh, now, of course, after the cross uh, of the officer, if they're the star witness or the only witness, or they'll go last if they're the star witness, the prosecution will rest their case. And then you present on any witnesses. If you have, usually it's just the client or maybe a, another witness that was at the scene. A, a truth smacking activist on the corner. If you need some help, feel free. Uh, my phone number is listed, but uh, here. Fifty percent of sober people fail the field sobriety test. I think it's a whole lot more than that, uh, Swap Peters, but who knows? The statistics. Uh, it's very easy. I've I've failed the the field sobriety test in uh, in closed in closed quarters. It was a presentation we were doing, and I've never done them before. I was just learning was like five or six years ago, and the lawyer asked me to do the field sobriety test, and I I just I tried to follow the instructions. I really tried. I was 100 percent sober, and I couldn't do it. Uh, and I hear it all the time from my clients. I was completely sober, and I couldn't do it sober. I tried to do it sober. Etc. They're designed for failure. It's, it's at this point, it's kind of a a no brainer to me. It's just instilling that in the jury is the key because a lot of jurors believe those field sobriety tests are ironclad proof unless there's video and then they see one way or the other. And by the way, cases where my clients don't pass the field sobriety test and I don't have anything else to hang on to, we say you can't factually um, uh, fight the case and you're, you're just going to lose. Facts of life. Welcome to reality. Um, the video is buffering and we're missing large portions of the video. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I don't know how to fix it, but you must be drinking. I am I am drinking uh, pita coco, coconut water. It's delicious, replenishing, and hydrating, by the way. Um, follow the law, damn it. I've watched enough videos of this, of his, and now I'm an expert. So if you ever got a DOI, I can save him. I appreciate that. Is it freezing or is it me? I think it's everybody. Respect from the UK. Love seeing you call the bad and experienced cops out there on their bullshit. I appreciate that, Najib. Have you ever received any threats from the police department? No, I'm just doing my job. There's no reason to. Uh, dude, your stream got shut down. Fellow attorneys didn't like you for sharing, giving away trade. These are not trade secrets, by the way. It's just people... Uh, either don't care to share or I, I don't I don't see this as as trade secrets. It's all this information is out there. I'm not I'm no different. Buffering is killing me. I'll watch it again later. Uh, how do you feel about paying the extra money to file for a hearing to, just to try and get your driving rights back? I don't exactly know what you're referring to. Uh, holding a DMV hearing to get your license back, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Maybe it depends. I don't know. Uh, I would really need to see uh, if it's in Kentucky. By all means, give me a call. You have to try again. You get turned down. I have to try again in a year. I don't know. Um, if you're trying to get your license back as a result of uh, conviction, uh, the law may be one sided, meaning just there's no way, or maybe there may be some loopholes. Uh, please don't call me if you're from out of state. Jesse Limas, I just don't know the laws and I don't have the time to invest into uh, these cases. Talk to people in your jurisdiction, okay? If you got any questions, by the way, now is the time. I know we only have like 20 people here. Um, I'm still getting back into the swing of things. I think I was able to reach like 80 last time. Not last time, uh, but the last time I did it back in March when I was straight. I, I only do Kentucky. 
I'm sorry, in Indiana. I'm starting to break into Indiana some more. And I think my connection is dropping back. I don't know what's going on with this. This is really starting to frustrate me. Ever since I moved to this office, guys and gals, I mean, it's it's awesome. I have this nice office over here, and I have the next door, which is twice as big, maybe even three times as big as this, to house all my future associates. But the internet connection here is just garbage, and it's it's just really frustrating me. But we'll we'll work on that. We got the microphone fixed. Hopefully, we'll work on that next. Um, and um, just kind of stabilize things as. Uh, and um, if you're in Indiana, I'll eventually break into Ohio and Tennessee. It's just uh, there's plenty of business in Kentucky right now uh, and Indiana. Obtuse one asks, uh, Larry, would you do a video about non-vehicle DUI, such as lawnmower, horses, bikes, covered that no trespassing sign will protect you from a DUI in your yard? I can actually answer that second part right now. Uh, but let's talk about the first one real quick. Yes, uh, I did a poll, I think, on uh, cross-examining the state expert. But honestly, after this uh, discussion of crossing the officer, uh, I don't know if I'll, I'll do, I haven't personally, I, I, in all candor, I haven't done enough of those cases. I don't know if I'm the best authority figure to discuss that. Um, now the second most voted was a video on non uh, vehicle DUIs, non motor vehicle DUI, lower a bicycle, a horse, etc. Uh, I think that's probably going to be my next one uh, next Sunday, but the second portion I can answer right now. Will a no trespassing sign protect you from a DUI in your yard? Their answer is not in Kentucky. Some states, I know that I think Virginia and Pennsylvania are the two that come to mind. Uh, it's it's all about how the DUI law is written. If the DUI on a highway or a roadway, something like that, um, and then A, under the influence of alcohol, B, 0.08 or greater, drugs in their system, blah, 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 marijuana. And if you're on private property, the law doesn't apply to you. So in some states, you can be on private property intoxicated, and it's fair game. They can't touch you. So it doesn't matter if you have the sign, you don't have the sign. Uh, I mean, in, in some states, it might actually work. It might play a difference uh, depending on... Uh, the jurisdiction and the language of the statute. In Kentucky, it is very, very private property, public property, public roadways, private roadways. It doesn't matter. As long as you're in some motor vehicle, and in some cases, non-motor vehicle, which we'll talk about next week, if you're found anywhere in the state under the influence of alcohol, under those circumstances, then you will be cited for DUI. So that's an easy answer. Uh, it doesn't matter that you may or may not have tras no trespassing signs on, uh, in your yard in Kentucky. It will not make a difference. Uh, recommend a book called How to Deal with the Police in Missouri. Thank you, Junk Man. Oh, hey, Liberty Cause. I was wondering where all my mods were. Uh, I'm streaming at 6 now. I but yeah. And I think we're, there we go, we're buffering again. Anyway, so I think seeing no other questions, we've been here for about 45 minutes. I had a New York case dismissed as the lawnmower was not a motor vehicle, it was household goods. This was in the gentleman's yard. Yeah, I can I can definitely see that happening, Ambry Smith. Uh, a lawnmower, there was somebody recently who got a, a DUI on a lawnmower Forget which state I saw the headline a few a couple of weeks ago, maybe. We had a an Amish guy get a DUI on a horse and buggy uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago. So these things happen. Again, not, one is I think more interesting to kind of listen to than really get involved with uh, cross examination of the police officer is uh, not something that we do on a typical Tuesday. So I understand it's very uh, profession specific and occasion specific, but if you all have a chance to try your cases out there, especially if you can't afford a lawyer and you're pro se, and these are these videos are for you, honestly. At the end of the day, if you can't afford me, 
use them as much as you can, as much as you want. Uh, that's what they're there for, to educate the public. Um, it's You're not digging into my pocket. I'm, I'm always going to be hired people who can afford me and want my services for their case. So it's it, this is, I think, the biggest misunderstanding of, of people, especially lawyers out there. Why should I give my craft away for free when I can be, uh, when I can be uh, paid to do it? Well, the mistake that they're making is, first of all, not everybody can afford you. And uh, by providing free information out there, you get a wide, you cast a wide net, I think. And people see, if you're, by the way, if you notice people who are stingy are always broke or always poor and people who give lavishly somehow are always wealthy and, and doing well for themselves. It's the same principle. If you just hog all the information to yourself, you're always going to be, you're always going to be of that mentality that there's not enough. I think there's plenty to go around. I think if people were, would just change their mentality and uh, by all means, I'm, I'm blessed and lucky and, and the, the, you know, lucked into a, a great family that raised me the, the way that uh, I wish everybody could get raised. But I really do think that if more people just get out of that mentality as much as they can, is, and I know it's not easy. You're right, Liberty Cause. Information is power, and uh, we should be sharing it. Uh, follow the law, damn it. If jury nullification is legal, then why can't you bring it up to the jury or the judge also bring it up to the jury in the courtroom? Uh, it's, in DUI cases, I almost never run into that. If I had a case for jury nullification, then maybe. But it, it just doesn't happen in, in the real world as much as, uh, as we think. Taking flight for someone who refuses field sobriety tasks, i.e. what typically gives probable cause, how do you fight those most successfully since all DUI reports start the same? Uh, give them the least amount of evidence. Uh, don't talk free evidence against you. That's just the first thing. I mean, I, I, it baffles me, but I've been in the game so long, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. But when I started this out, I, I understand exactly where, uh, where everyone's coming from. Well, the police are my friend. They just they want to help me. They, I want to talk to them. It's a natural inclination. When you're in trouble, what do you do with your parents? Mommy, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. Mom. Uh, please, please don't take my games away. Uh, please don't take my allowance away. I'm so sorry. I'll do anything. What do you want me to do? Uh, I'll, I'll clean the dishes. Um, yes, I did eat the chocolate. I'm so sorry. That's just the natural inclination of a human being to apologize for their, their behavior to an authority figure. And the police are abusing it. That's all it is. Uh, they're abusing that psychological element that we all have within our, our, uh, our brain. And they're not there to help you. They're there to destroy you. I mean, think about it for a second, right? If you all knew all this information going in years ago, if you ever had a, even the slightest run in with the law, forget drinking, drinking and driving, just maybe the officer coming to the bar or coming to your home or whatever, you, we always want to see – we don't want to see police officers as evil. We do not want to see them as bad. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes we have to understand that they're, they may not be evil. Again, they, they're they still good people, some of them. <laughs> unfortunately, I, I just, I can't, I can't sugarcoat it too much. It really is scary. But if the case goes to court or whatever, because people need to shut their mouths. Shut your freaking mouth. That's my catchphrase. Don't give them free evidence because the more you talk, the more you volunteer information, the more you volunteer evidence that can be used against you. And they say, well, what about my Miranda warnings? Well, if you volunteer information, Miranda doesn't kick in because one of the prongs of Miranda is interrogation. You may be in custody. You may already be in handcuffs. But if they're not asking you questions and you're just yelling, it was only seven beers. I'm okay. Well, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to use it against you and you have no way of uh, – uh, suppressing it or excluding it. So, yeah, I, I'm buffering it. Uh, blank on his name uh, when I absolutely need it. Anyway, uh, great movie, by the way. I'm going to end this here. Um, sorry about the microphone issue. Sorry about the, the whole buffering We'll fix it all in turn. I think the microphone issue should be fixed from now on. 
like, comment below, subscribe to my channel. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all the participation. I appreciate the questions. Thank you all for being here and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. And I will be seeing you next Sunday, which will be the 14th. Uh, we will be talking about either cross-examining the state expert or non-motor vehicle DUIs. I haven't decided yet, but it'll be one or the other. And uh, I hope you all be safe. Take care.